introduction. Ah, can you hear me? OK. Let's do, do it this way. And so hi, everybody. Thanks, thanks again for the invitation and for the kind uh, introduction. So despite the catchy title, I will uh, just basically talk about uh, some ideas around how to achieve quantum advantage and how, how we want to bring down the tipping point of uh, achieving quantum advantage by coming up with new ideas. And so many of, of these things I, I will present to you are actually based on joint works with the group of Professor Simon Benjamin. And so does this one work or? Yeah, it should be. I should be, yeah. I should stay really close, okay. But you yeah, perhaps it's easier if I just hold it. Okay, should, should be better now. And so first of all, I guess you all know that quantum supremacy is just uh, uh, a definition that at, at a point, we are at a point where quantum computers can significantly outperform any reasonable classical computation. Uh, but it does not say anything about usefulness or practicality. And so in this talk, I will primarily focus on practical quantum advantage. So that uh, the task where the quantum computer outperforms uh, the classical one is actually useful for something. And that's basically our quest to look for, first of all, uh, applications. So that's, that's one part of the job. But there is an entire stack. So it's a very complex problem to achieve practical quantum advantage. Um, and there is an entire stack. I'm only showing here four levels in this stack. And the talk will only be concerned with the two middle uh, uh, layers, in, in particular el error handling and quantum algorithms. But of course, you have to know that uh, underneath there is all the hardware development that is going on and there is incredible progress being made. And so first of all, you might know very well that uh, quantum computers promise to solve problems expo exponentially faster than classical computers. And a typical example is Shor's factoring algorithm. But the problem is that if you work out the numbers, what you need, it turns out you need on the order of 10 to the 12 quantum gates to, to uh, factor a reasonable sized integer. And that roughly translates to, if you calculate the amount of time it takes to implement a single gate, it roughly means that with realistic gate times, it will take weeks or even months uh, with a quantum computer to run that algorithm. So that also means that you need to keep the qubits alive for, for that long. But we know that in the NISC era, we, we just want to use physical qubits and their li lifetimes are way lower than, than weeks or months. It's more like on the order of milliseconds or seconds. So some people claim it can be seconds in ions, for example. But th that's why the idea is to abandon deep uh, quantum circuits and look for new, uh, completely new applications, an entirely new paradigm, where we only use uh, shallow quantum circuits, meaning that we only pack in as many gates as we can within the reasonable lifetime of the qubits. And that can be like a few thousand gates. That's likely won't uh, get you quantum advantage because we can still simulate those kinds of circuits. But on the order of tens of thousands of gates, we know it becomes really difficult to simulate the system classically. And we also know that surprisingly, these, even these shallow circuits can uh, prepare surprisingly complex quantum states that can really well approximate, for example, ground states of some practically useful problems. And so typically the paradigm is that we, after we run our shallow circuit, we perform measurements to extract uh, information out of our quantum system. And for that, we have to use some form of quantum error mitigation. The reason is that obviously we do nothing about the errors during the circuit execution. So we have to somehow deal with those errors. And then of course this par paradigm relies on, for example, training the circuits. It's not necessarily the only application, but uh, the paradigm where you train your circuit has become uh, really successful and it grew an entire field um, out of this idea. It, it was initially motivated by, by physics and chemistry that you try to tune the parameters inside your circuit such that you as best as possible approximate some ground state. But it turns out the same ground state search problem can be applied to many, many different other problems and I just show here uh, a figure. It looks a bit complicated, but basically you can apply it to machine learning problems, mathematical optimization problems, and beyond. And here are two review paper, three review papers that appeared almost simultaneously on this topic. And obviously there are uh, drawbacks here. I'm just telling you here the pros, but there are quite significant challenges with this paradigm. So first of all, 
we have to deal with somehow the effect of errors. And quantum error mitigation seems to be the only way so far. <coughs> and of course, we have to deal with the circuit training if, if, our, if we rely on that kind of paradigm. And so the main observation of, in quantum error mitigation is that we, we basically, in every single algorithm that uh, we can think of in this v variational quantum eigen Solgberg paradigm, in the end, we want to estimate expected values of observables. So in that sense, we don't even care about correcting the errors in the quantum state, but rather we only care about correcting the errors in the expected value itself. And so the simplest way is to actually try to learn how the noise affects uh, the expected value and try to figure out uh, how, uh, what that expected value would ideally be if we had no errors. And the simplest idea is literally just doing an extrapolation. So you use your quantum device, you measure the expected value at some physical error rate, and then you try to engineer your quantum device so that it magnifies the error rate. So uh, it's extremely hard to make the error rates come down to get better, but it's actually very easy to make it worse. Uh, but it's very hard to make it precisely twice as bad. And IBM have pioneered this, and this is actually the first paper that presents error mitigation, and this is actually where the entire field started. And still, extrapolation works surprisingly well, despite its simplicity. And we will hear more about that, uh, I think, even later today. And I have to say, this is not the only idea. There are zillions of other error mitigation ideas out there. Uh, typically, these are tricks, all kinds of tricks that we try to exploit to deal with errors. Uh, typically, we don't get theoretical guarantees. These are heuristics. And recently, a review paper appeared uh, partly from our group. So do check this out if you're interested in the topic. And I will now just discuss one particular kind of error mitigation here. It's one of my favorite uh, error mitigation techniques. Uh, I call it error suppression by derangement, or exponential error suppression. But the same idea was also developed by a team at Google. And so you can see that there are these two concurrent papers appeared in the same journal just, just a month apart. And literally, the idea is the same, that you, instead of just trying to deal with errors in a single quantum computer, you actually introduce redundancy. So in some sense, it's similar to quantum error correction, in that we add more quantum computers to our system. It's different than quantum error correction, because we, we don't entangle the qubits during the computation. But rather, we, in principle, we can even use completely separate uh, chips or completely separate quantum computers to run the exact same computation simultaneously without any communication in between the, in between the copies. And rho is the output, noisy output state that comes out from that quantum computer or each quantum computer. And then the idea is that we entangle these copies and thereby we can measure an observable sigma here with an exponentially suppressed uh, error rate where exponential is in the number of the copies in the state. There are some caveats to this. Uh, but I'll try to simplify it down as much as possible and explain why it actually works. So imagine that from a qu noisy quantum computer, the th state that comes out is a density matrix rho. Since it's a density matrix, we know it must have eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And since it's a representation of a state, we know that the eigenvalues are actually probabilities that a particular state happens. And the eigenvectors are the pure states that correspond to those probabilities. And typically we have, in typical error models, we have a dominant component, like uh, one state happens with probability 50%, and then there are exponentially many uh, small probabilities that some errors happen in our quantum device. But let's just focus on the dominant component. This happens with a probability lambda. And when it comes out of my quantum device in a single shot run, then I do a measurement. I want to measure this observable sigma. As you can see, I, I represent here the end copies of that pure state. And I reproduce the expected result. So that's the ex expected value I want to measure, ideally. However, there are exponentially many error events. And one of them might happen with uh, quite substantial probability, unfortunately. And when that happens, effectively, I'm looking at now the other eigenvectors of the density matrix, which happen with some smaller probabilities, lambda k. But when it happens, then we see that there's an other eigenvector in one of the copies. This is the most likely event that can happen. And as you can see, unfortunately, it yields a wrong, erroneous measurement process. 
and, and that's, that contributes a burden to our uh, expected value overall. And so we want to remove that. And it turns out we can actually remove uh, that error event just by, instead of measuring the operator sigma, we rather measure the operator sigma times the swap operation. And if you work out what happens then, the swap actually uh, swaps the ordering of the registers, the incoming input states. And because of that, the scalar product factorizes into this form, where we have a scalar product between two eigenvectors of the density matrix. And since they are orthonormal, uh, we get a zero contribution. So basically, just by measuring the product of sigma times swap, I've managed to remove uh, error contributions from our state. And we can generalize, actually, this idea to uh, more complicated permutations of the registers. And we can make a general statement, a provable statement, that actually this idea filters out any noise contribution that breaks global permutation symmetry. So in that sense, it ex excludes any single error event or any double error event if we have more than two copies. But still, uh, it includes the error-free state with a probability lambda to the power of n. So that's a price we have to pay, because even the ideal event is uh, scaled down exponentially. But at the same time, the error events that can only contribute to uh, our measurement process are the ones that still, still respect permutation symmetry. And those are the ones uh, where the exact same errors happen to each and every copy, and those are exponentially unlikely. And so that, that's roughly the idea why it works. I'm, uh, I'm hiding some stuff under the rug. Uh, I'd be happy to chat about that later. Uh, but suffice to say, there is a lot of uh, different possibilities for physically realizing this. And one possibility is by looking at multi-core architectures. So here the idea is that we actually have, um, um, so this is supported by a company called Quantum Motion. And they are developing silicon-based quantum computing technologies. And there the idea is that you can use uh, standard fabri silicon fabrication techniques to manufacture chips. But on a single chip, we can have like hundreds or thousands of quantum cores, si small single quantum cores of let's say 50 or 100 qubits. So that's, that's shown here. These are two cores. And then we just need to establish some quantum communication links between them. And it turns out we did some quite realistic uh, physical simulations already with current technology is doable to establish these links and perform teleportation across uh, the different quantum cores. And it turns out any noise source that's, uh, that's present during that teleportation process, so the communication between the two quantum cores, is subject to this um, exponential suppression of errors. So it works extremely well uh, with this error mitigation technique. And I'm also pointing here to another paper that uh, the Oxford Ion Trap team actually has the third record in having the best fidelities in, in uh, doing these teleportation experiments or creating entanglements between physically separate ion traps. And this is just uh, a numerical simulation. I'll just very quickly uh, go through this. I don't want to explain the details. But basically, it shows a typical application where we want to determine a ground state of some spin, spin problem. And the x-axis shows the circuit error rate, the average number of errors in the execution of the entire circuit. And we know that error mitigation is kind of limited to the case when we are not significantly beyond one error per circuit execution. Unfortunately, that's the case for all error mitigation techniques. But if we don't do any error mitigation, that's the red line. We, we get a substantial hit from, from circuit errors. And the dashed lines here show what happens if I take this derangement idea with two copies, with three copies in the green line, um, brown, th uh, three, that's the four copies. So basically you can see that I exponentially suppress the errors, uh, but not indefinitely. Actually there is a noise floor and there is, uh, there is a quite good reason for that, why that happens. But that noise floor is actually quite small. So in practice this seems to work pretty well. And I think we will hear later about this later this week because Google have performed this experiment and observed uh, a very significant suppression of the errors. Um, but the ideas I presented assumed that you want to measure just a single expected value. And it's actually rarely the case that you, you want to estimate just a single expected value. Rather, what you do in, in, a, in a very typical application, you want to measure, for example, a Hamiltonian 
And for that, you need to decompose the Hamiltonian into uh, Pauli strings or a linear combination of some operators. And then you would measure them one by one. Uh, but that's actually, actually extremely inefficient if we go to larger system sizes, because you have to perform uh, a targeted experiment for each and every observable. And actually, classical shadows mean kind of a breakthrough uh, in that regard, because they kind of allow you to estimate simultaneously many, many observables. So the idea in classical shadows, I'm not sure everybody has, whether you have heard about classical shadows, it's become a hot topic. Uh, but I'll just very briefly explain what, what this means. So uh, in an experiment, it means that you run your quantum circuit. Uh, you perform some random rotations. In our case, let's just constrain ourselves to uh, Pauli rotations. This means that I apply a single qubit unitary to every single qubit in my circuit. That's trivial to do even with uh, current uh, quantum computers. And then I measure every qubit, and then I save the outcome. I also save what kind of rotation operator I applied before measurement. And then I repeat this experiment many, many times to collect many shots. And basically, a classical shadow is a collection of this data set, the different measurement bases and the different, different outcomes. And this is a data set, uh, as you can see here. Again, I can store it in a classical computer. It's, it's actually a classical representation of the entire density matrix my, of my state. And from, from that, in a classical computer, I can predict whatever property I want to predict. For example, uh, entropies or expected values of observables, even fidelities. Uh, but the problem was that this idea was developed for predicting expected values in the noisy state rho. And I'm just pointing here a very recent paper from my group where we uh, actually looked at the idea that what, what happens if we rather want to predict many properties of the ideal state? That's actually the regime of quantum error mitigation. And it's actually a very relevant question because classical shadows have really took off. Uh, but apparently, it hasn't been completely solved that in practice, you actually want to mitigate the errors in the classical shadows. And it turns out, we looked at what kind of error mitigation techniques work well and naturally with classical shadows. And it turns out, probabilistic error cancellation works extremely well. It's, it's, uh, it fits very well with uh, classical shadows. Because the two protocols are essentially Monte Carlo schemes. We can just combine them into one combined scheme. And I told you that classical shadows are great, but I haven't yet mentioned that uh, in the Preskill paper, they actually present uh, rigorous theoretical guarantees that it will work. And we generalized those theoretical guarantees. And basically, we could rederive every result, assuming that you are performing error mitigation. And so this formula here shows how many, num how many shots you need to take in order to achieve a precision epsilon. So with the standard measurement scheme, you would need a number of shots that scales with inversely with the square of uh, the precision epsilon. <coughs> here we have some extra nasty prefactors. You don't have to worry about these too much. The important bit is that m is the number of how many observables I, I want to predict. And you can see that we have a logarithm of m. So it means that essentially for free, we can pre predict many, many uh, observables. And then there's another factor, 3 to the power of q. q is the locality of the Pauli string. For example, a two local Pauli string is x1, x10. And as you can see, the sample complexity blows up exponentially. But in, in many practical applications that I will show you, we only care about local Pauli strings. And we will focus on local Pauli strings. So that's just a constant prefactor. We don't have to care about that. And then there is this factor, which is very well known in error mitigation. It's actually the cost of error mitigation. It depends on the circuit error rate, this, this g norm factor. And it blows up exponentially with the, with the circuit error rate. But it's still reasonably small in case uh, if you are constrained to circuit errors 1 or around 1. And the other major challenge in this field is to deal with the, the parameter training. And actually, even if we have a perfect quantum computer that has no errors and just runs these shallow quantum circuits, uh, we might be wonder whether, whether even such a device could be useful, despite it's noise-free. And this idea was originally proposed in this paper and has gone a long, very long way. And we understand it much better what kind of limitations there are. And first of all, there is a practical limitation, and it's
is that we have to take a very large number of shots in order to perform an optimization, a parameter training. And there is no, really no way around that. We can uh, reduce the number of shots by a few orders of magnitude, uh, but like numbers 10 to the 9 or in excess are quite typical, and there is really no way to, to deal with that. And on top of that, we have other issues. For example, in this training landscape, we might want to do gradient descent to find the local minimum. However, once we find the local minimum, we might think that, oh, we have found the ground state. But it turns out we might be just sitting in a local optimum and the global optimum is somewhere else. So we are nowhere near to the ground state. And it turns out there are exponentially many such local traps uh, for far away from the, from the global optimum. And on top of that, for some systems, we can even um, have so-called barren plateaus, which means that the surface is just completely flat and there is no gradient information that we can reasonably get out. And so one, one possible solution to overcome this uh, was, or overcome some of these limitations, was proposed in that paper, where we realized that in VQE, you are kind of posing your problem such that you are only interested in one single expected value, the energy, and you want to optimize that energy as a function of the parameters. But you're, you are creating a bottleneck just by reducing the quality of the quantum state into a single number, the energy. And in this paper, what we do, we instead say that let's optimize simultaneously 10 to the 8 surfaces. And it sounds actually extreme, but it's possible with classical shadows with almost no overhead compared to standard VQE. And we can really benefit from having information from simultaneously many, many uh, cost functions that we optimize. So the details are non-trivial, and, and the idea is actually significantly different than VQE, because it's not even a minimization problem anymore. The idea relies on so-called covariances. And so here, here's the definition of, of an operator covariance. Given you have a Hamiltonian, that's the problem you want to solve, and you want to find eigenstates of it. Then we define covariances with respect to any operator A. It might look similar to you if you satisfy a equals h. In that case, the covariance is actually just uh, the expected value of the square of the Hamiltonian minus the square of the expected value. So that's the standard variance that we know from even from classical statistics. And indeed, the covariance is a generalization of that, where we look at how different operators correlate with the Hamiltonian. And we know that if we are in an eigenstate, then the variance must be zero. And actually, it's quite, quite easy to mathematically prove that if we are in an eigenstate, then necessarily any covariance must be zero as well. So this actually helps us to define an exponentially large number of different uh, constraints that an, any eigenstate has to satisfy. So we have an exponential number of sufficient conditions, but the necessary conditions only grow polynomially, because we can just verify whether we satisfy variance equals zero. That's only polynomial time. And this gives us a very powerful tool to actually define, redefine VQE in some sense, because the covariance is just a number, but through the state, parameterized state, it actually depends on the parameters. So now we can define our problem such that I have this large number of covariance functions as a function of the parameters, so it spans some surfaces, as you can see here on the left. And I can define my problem such that I want that each and every covariance be zero. This is a root-finding problem. So I'm looking for joint roots of, of, of many equations simultaneously. And Newton has already solved this problem numerically. Or Newton has showed us how to solve this problem numerically by using this iteration where you, for a single variable, what we do, we calculate the gradient and then we try to fit a linear function to that gradient and extrapolate to the root of that linear function and jump there and just iterate it many times. Uh, it actually converges surprisingly fast. So the Newton iteration is extremely fast in convergence. And the generalization to multidimensional surfaces uses the so-called Jac Jacobian matrix. It's, uh, it's actually just a matrix of partial derivatives. It's, it's nothing too extreme. We can actually measure both the covariances and the Jacobian with from classical shadows, meaning that we just run our quantum computer, we run our variational circuits, like here, we perform random measurements in random bases, 
we store the outcomes in a classical computer, and then we let the classical computer to work out billions of different uh, covariances. And then the classical computer will tell us how to update the parameters so that we jump closer to the, to the expected root. And we iterate this until we find a joint root of, of, of this uh, equation system. And actually, it turns out the cost of, of doing this uh, in terms of quantum costs, so the number of shots, is only logarithmic in the number of how many covariances I take, and c. And the, and the classical post-processing is only linear in the number of constraints. Even though I have a matrix factor equation here, it's provably just linear in, in complexity. And we actually worked out how long it will take for 10 to the 8 covariances. And it takes less than an hour in an HPC cluster. So it's very doable. And we actually observed in numerical simulations that as I take larger and la larger number of NC, so I take more and more equation systems and I solve them simultaneously, then I can proportionally um, improve the quality of the optimization. And we, we saw something like five orders of magnitude improvements compared to VQE. So really massive improvements. Uh, I don't want to show the details. I will just show you one application example. So since the problem is defined such that it doesn't search for ground states, it, it rather gets attra attracted to any eigenstate, I have to provide a good initial state. Actually, we, we did some uh, thorough tests, and it turns out the approach is very, very similar to phase estimation. It shows all the similar qualities. So if we start with a random state, we first have to do some VQE or some way of initialization uh, to get a state that's relatively close to the ground state. Let's say it has a 50% overlap. And once we are there, we can start this COVAR approach, and it's rapidly, within like uh, 30 iterations, y you get within shock noise limit uh, close to the, to the diff different eigenstates. So here, this is the, the ground state, first excited sa state, and so on. And this can be used to find these lowest lying eigenstates. And the interesting bit is that with VQE, even if you are starting close to the ground state, you might get trapped in local optima, because I told you there are exponentially many of those local optima. So here the orange line shows you that VQE gets trapped. You might think that here you're in an eigenstate, but you are not. And then if we start COVAR from there, it jumps out of the local optimum and actually finds the ground state properly. The reason for that is it's not based on energy minimization. There is no, no sense in which we can define a local optimum. It's based on root finding. And I hope I still have a few minutes to to uh, talk about this last topic, where I would say, let's forget everything I just said. Let's not use quantum error mitigation. Let's not uh, train quantum circuits. Just simply use time evolution. And it turns out quantum computers are extremely good for time evolution. It's actually the, the, the best possible application for quantum computers is, is performing the time evolution. And we can do that with digital programmable quantum computers, with like signal processing. We can do that with variational circuits, but we can even do it in an analog way with ion traps or with neutral atoms. Uh, but overall, I I'm sure you have seen this equation. It just shows you that if you expand any state into an eigenstate, into a set of eigenstates of a Hamiltonian, then under the time evolution, uh, every state picks up a phase factor proportional to the corresponding eigenenergy. This is what we, this, these are the phases that we want to learn in phase estimation. But phase estimation is expensive because you need uh, controls, unitary evolutions, and so on. But let's do it with, without controls, just plain and simple time evolution of a quantum state. And at every time point, we measure an expected value of an observable, as you can see it here. There are many observables I can measure. I can make up lots of exponentially many observables I can measure. I can measure each and every Pauli string. The interesting bit is that each and every observable has to oscillate with exactly the same frequencies, uh, regardless of which observable you measure. However, the intensity depends on which observable you measure. So if you initialize your state such that you have only overlap with, uh, you have only overlap with the first few excited states, then you know that you will only have a few oscillation frequencies present. Uh, but the intensity will highly depend on which observable is good for you. Uh, the, the relevant observables will be the excitation operators. And actually, this is how this paradigm works. You just uh, simply evolve your time, time evolve your quantum system, measure expected values, 
Uh, actually, we do that with classical shadows. So essentially, we just do this randomized measurement at every point in time and store that in a classical computer. And then we let the classical computer to work out all these time-dependent signals and work out the correlations between them that I will discuss now. Uh, so that's the main idea. We use uh, classical shadows. And I told you it's very, very easy to estimate local Pauli operators with shadows. And it turns out if you just restrict, restrict to three local Pauli strings, we can capture almost all the physics we have in typical uh, uh, physical systems. But of course, it highly depends on the problem. Uh, but we can straightforwardly just extend the approach to four local Pauli strings and beyond. And basically, we measure this data matrix where every row and column corresponds to a different time or different observable measurement. And this is how it looks. So the y-axis is the time, a time evolving 200 steps. And at every time step, I can use classical shadows to predict many different observables. But here in this plot, I actually only use 10 shots. And that means I have basically just shot noise in this, in this figure. So you might wonder, how, how, how is it even possible to extract information from, from such a noisy like data matrix? And the answer is actually, indeed it is just shock noise, or mostly just shock noise, but there are correlations. Actually, there is a strong temporal correlation in this y direction, because the oscillating signal is strongly also correlated with itself at a later time. But also there is correlations in the x-axis, because each and every observable is strongly correlated with each and every other observable, because they oscillate with exactly the same frequencies. And if we have uh, a good initialization, so overlap with only the first few eigenstates, then we can isolate only a few frequencies. And that means we have this very strong correlation that we can reveal with something that resembles to a principal component analysis. But basically, I calculate a correlation matrix. That's just a matrix matrix product of this data matrix with itself. And you can already see, I don't know if you can see it, but there is like a periodic pattern in that, uh, in that uh, correlation matrix. And to calculate this requires only linear time in the number of different observables. So it's do very doable at, uh, with an HPC cluster. And it turns out with a single HPC node, we can do this in less than an hour for as many as 10 to the 8 signals. And here, here, here I show how it scales. And once we, once we are done, we actually want to calculate the dominant eigenvectors of this uh, matrix. And the reason for that, in signal processing, they call this the signal subspace. The signal subspace is spanned by the dominant eigenvectors of this matrix. And actually, th those will be the, the oscillating things that you see on the screen. And from, from, from that signal subspace, by just doing the Fourier transform or, or doing some more sophisticated techniques, we can extract the spectrum. And as you can see, even with 10 shots uh, per time step, we can extract a really good, strong signal. So this simulation is for 14 qubits for a highly non-trivial problem. And the advantage of, of using classical shadows is that we can, by increasing the, the number of observables, I can, with the square root, uh, suppress the shock noise, or actually improve the signal-to-noise ratio in my spectrum. And I hope I have, I still have two minutes, I think. I wanted to show you two bits why it's interesting to do shadow spectroscopy. And the first one is that we can actually theoretically prove that this idea is uh, noise robust in the sense that the actual signal we observe is just a linear combination of the ideal signal plus an artifact. But the artifact is not structured, it's, it's, uh, it's in the baseline. So it means that if I have errors in my, in my quantum gates, I can still perfectly extract the signal, only that as I increase the circuit error rate, I will have an exponential decrease of the signal intensity. So this simulation shows the exact same problem evaluated at different noise, noise strengths. And as you can see, the intensity goes down, unfortunately, exponentially. We can't really do anything about that. But the peak position is exactly at the same center. And that means it's basically perfectly, provably uh, immune to noise. There are, of course, some, some assumptions. But, but, it's, but it works surprisingly well in practice. And finally, I wanted to show you that there is another kind of noise. Uh, in particular, it's not actually easy to simulate time evolution. It might be the most natural for quantum computers. 
but it's not very easy. The reason for that is we still need quite deep circuits for time evolution. And this one shows a trotterized evolution, and we take very, very rough trotterizations, like time steps 0 0.5, so we get extremely large algorithmic errors. But as we decrease the time steps, we are still far away from the ideal uh, gap energy. Uh, however, we can extrapolate, and we can surprisingly well recover the ideal gap energy just by extrapolation. And so I hope I could convince you that there is it is reasonable to expect some form of quantum advantage. Uh, it's not trivial to pinpoint which problems uh, uh, we will achieve that, but we will definitely need to exploit all kinds of tricks uh, and techniques to achieve that, not just at these two levels of the stack I talked about, but also finding the right kinds of applications where classical computers are not good enough, quantum computers are good enough, and also we, we just need hardware improvements, we need better gates to achieve that. But it seems we are getting getting there soon. And here's just a short advertisement that I'll uh, check out Questlink if you're interested in a quantum simulator. Sorry, I was a... Thanks, uh, thanks.